Thanks for joining us. Good morning, everyone. I'm Don Lupo, Think LA Executive Director. Welcome to the next Evolution of Entertainment, presented by Warner Media. We're so glad you could join us this morning. And before we get started, just a few reminders. Please visit thinkla.org to register for our weekly newsletter and to stay in touch with our community. Plus, the Think LA podcast is now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Pocket Casts, and more. I hope you'll all join us at our upcoming events. Tonight, it's time for fun at our Best of the 90s Film and Music Trivia Contest. Pro tip, the answer is always Nirvana. Our annual entertainment marketing breakfast on October 8th is about rewriting the script, the future of entertainment. We'll have presentations on diversity, film marketing, TV tech, and a special chat featuring Charlemagne the God, and he'll be talking about podcasts. So please tune in for that one. You can hone your virtual presentation skills at our three-day lunchtime workshop beginning October 12th. We focus on body and face language, fear and nerves, and how to present to people or even to an empty room, which a lot of us can kind of relate to lately. It's interactive, it's hands-on, and you'll be sure to learn a few tips and tricks. This is one of our most popular courses, so please register today. And finally, save the date for our auto summit on October 21st with keynotes from Lisa Matarazzo of Lexus, Allison Witherspoon from Nissan, breakout sessions, and much more. And as you listen to our panelists' insights today, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your questions. We'll do our best to answer them all after the discussion ends. And major thanks to Warner Media for sponsoring this webinar and adding to our lineup of great content for our community. And now please welcome our moderator, Andy Barnett, VP, Western Ad Sales at Warner Media. Thank you very much. I appreciate that nice introduction. So I am Andy Barnett, VP of West Coast Sales, formerly of Xander, and now proudly part of the Warner Media commercial family. So welcome to the next evolution of entertainment. Today, and I'm really excited about today, we're gonna to discuss how technology is changing entertainment. From new devices, such as VR and AR headsets, to five and a half inch HD phones, to connected cars, we're gonna discuss how tech is providing new ways to capture and provide new ideas to watch entertainment and sports. We'll discuss virtual worlds, virtual concerts, and virtual betting. Yes, I said it, virtual betting. I'm looking, part, I'm looking forward to that part of the panel. We'll discuss AI and the future of entertainment marketing and how technology, innovation, and digital experiences are radically changing with the power, the speed, and the connectivity of 5G. I have a panel of four distinguished guests from technology and entertainment companies. Joanna Popper from HP, Rick Hack from Intel, Seth Cole from Turner Sports, and Jason Inskeep from AT&T. So let's get started. And let's start with a quick introduction from each one of our panelists. So please share your current role and the company you work for. Joanna, why don't we start with you? Hi, my name is Joanna Popper. I work at HP on a virtual reality team. I focus on our go-to-market and also our location-based entertainment initiatives. And Andy and I used to work together back in our NBC Universal days. Absolutely. It's great to see you again, and thank you for joining our panel. Rick? Hi, I'm Rick Hack. I lead our media and entertainment partnerships and strategy on behalf of our sales and marketing organization. So inward-facing, having a dotted line to all our different organizations under our umbrella, then outward-facing to the media and entertainment vertical and how we collaborate. Great. And thank you for joining, Rick. Jason? Hey, thanks. Jason Inskip, AT&T, uh, director of our 5G Center of Excellence. And our role is we kind of work behind the scenes with our customers back into uh, how the, the production will be made on the other side. I've done a lot of things with the CES team and things like that and actually see it on the other ends. Just step back a second and see it is, is, is pretty crazy coming from the drawing board to the field and, or, the, or the arena. So uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. Seth? Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Seth Cole. I lead our brand partnerships team for Turner Sports, which is part of Warner Media, which is also part of AT&T. So obviously a lot of corporate cousins here uh, on the meeting. But basically any way we integrate a brand within to our events, uh, linear broadcast, digital properties, uh, or social properties. That's my focus. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, let's get into it. Joanna, let's just start with you. 
HP VR G2 headset launching this fall. Can you share anything with us of this exciting launch? Sure, sure, sure. Thank, yeah, thanks for, for asking. We have announced at HP, we've announced a really exciting new uh, VR headset. It's actually right here. Uh, here it is. Um, it is going to be launching this fall. It's the first partnership we've had with Valve. So it is a partnership between HP, Microsoft, and Valve. For those of you who don't know Valve, they're one of the major leaders in the gaming world in terms of making games, distribution platforms, and they were pioneers in pretty much all of the early VR headsets. So we're thrilled that they're coming in and, and working with us on the headset. It's incredibly high resolution, 2160 by 2160 per eye. So that's the highest resolution headset out there. It's easy to use. It's tethered to a PC, so you get all the full power of the PC with the headsets, you know, really doubling down on that high resolution and high performance. And it is incredibly comfortable. Actually, one of our reviewers from Tested just said it's like a warm bath for their eyes for the first time they're able to use a VR headset for extended period of time. So everyone get ready for your, to bathe your, your, uh, your eyes. So it's launching this fall and we actually will be announcing the launch date really soon. We have pre-orders going in about uh, nearly 25 countries already. So if you're jump on in if you're interested. But yeah, we're, we're, we're thrilled about it. And we have tons of partners from entertainment to enterprise to training, uh, healthcare, education, uh, gamers, architecture, engineering, construction, all really, really excited for it. That's awesome. Congratulations. Can you also share with maybe the larger group here a little bit about the ecosystem, Oculus Quest 2 coming, HTC Vive, PlayStation jumping in it? Just maybe a little quick recap of the VR ecosystem. Sure. There's well, there's there's lots of um, there's lots of different players in, in in the field. I think the the the, the similarity is that most of the big tech companies like that you named or just you know company in general working in the space see VR and AR as the future of computing. And so you know we're currently in this third wave, your mobile social cloud wave of computing. And most of our of, of, of these of, of our company and most of the big tech companies see this as the next wave of computing and so see that it's incredibly important to be building on and creating what that wave of computing is. You know, HP was founded 81 years ago, where the founders of Silicon Valley um, are credited with like being the founders of Silicon Valley. As you know, it, the two founders were in a garage creating technology for Walt Disney for the movie Fantasia. So nice, nice long legacy there. Um, and so most big tech companies are looking at, you know, what, how are they going to contribute to this next wave of computing? And so each, and each company has taken a diff different role in terms of, you know, having a headset like PlayStation that's really targeted to people who already have a PlayStation um, or Oculus is, is targeting a lower price point, but trying to build out masses and, or something like what we're doing with Valve and what some, some other things Valve is doing is really targeting that high, the high, higher quality. Um, and yet the, the price is still only uh, 599. So not, not out of, uh, you know, not, not incredibly high priced. That's great. Thank you. We'll definitely come back to this. I want to talk to you a little bit about content. Rick, when we think of Intel, we definitely, most, most people, I think, think of a technology company, a chip company. How was Intel getting into entertainment? Yeah, great question. You know, I, I didn't bring any cool devices on the back shelf like Joanna has here. This has so, Intel uh, inside, though, at least. It's yeah, it's true. Thank this you. Is, uh, Intel in processor's in there, so I brought it for you. <laughs> Thank you. We're an ingredient to many of our wonderful partners like Joanna and, and uh, other OEMs and, and cloud companies out there. So, you know, we, we're an enabler uh, in a very good way. We, we enable amazing experiences. And one of the things that we do or have done recently is really get into sports in a big way. So, um, if you are watching NFL, if you're watching NBA, and you stop on a single play of action, and you see that replay, and you see that that that, that shift in the frame, that 360 bullet time, you think about the Matrix type of effect. Um, that's that's us. That's that's us with cameras in the stadium that uh, use the volume of that stadium to uh, replay that given event, and then we 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 throw that within a period of about 30 to. I don't know, close to a minute period of time, we can analyze, we can take all that data and deliver it in a 2D uh, manner within a broadcast, which is, um, which is a feat we've been working on for a long time. So we've taken that model of what you have with those 38 cameras in a given venue or in a stadium, 
And now we've taken that and placed it into a controlled studio environment. So in addition to having sports, um, which you might have also seen if you look at uh, so your Twitter feed, there's even you'll be the player, those types of uh, engagements where you get the view of the player and, and even questions like what would you do and given four scenarios, how you'd see it from different perspectives. So taking that point of view, now putting it in a studio environment where you can actually uh, control and, and create new types of experiences, what we call volumetric capture and take the entire volume of that space, which we have at Intel Studios down in Manhattan Beach. And we've done uh, experience from music type of performances uh, to reimagining iconic film properties like, like Greece. And recently we've gone to the Venice Film Festival. I'm sure Joanna's familiar with this, with some VR-based experiences. And so both, both delivery on a VR perspective, also an augmented reality perspective, but looking at all different immersive ways that we can deliver content. So I know it's kind of unusual. Intel's usually, much oftentimes you see us as a silicon-based company, but we're using our silicon and transitioning into this data company in order to deliver these types of um, unique experiences. That's great. Can you actually elaborate a little bit on the actual studio and share some examples of what you've used it for in the past? Sure. Um, so we are at MBS, Manhattan Beach Studios, we have a 25,000 square foot facility in which there looks like a giant half dome type of a rector set. And so you've got a hundred cameras hung on this on this, uh, on this dome that faces inward that captures 10,000 square feet of capture space. So you can imagine choreography that we've done uh, with, with, a, with an artist, a, a K-pop band called NCT 127, similar, similar to like a BTS. They're very, very popular. Um, and an artist, uh, we work with various independent film companies as well as uh, major film companies. We created a partnership with Paramount Pictures when we first came out of the gates. And as I was mentioning about the property Greece, we worked with the original director, Randall Kleiser, and recreated an iconic song, You're the One That I Want, um, using 20 different, 20, 22 different dancers and actors on the given stage, looking at uh, and, and recreating those iconic scenes that you remember from the dining hall to the, uh, the dorm room and ultimately to the theme park at the end of the movie with the car that flies off into the distance. So we showcased that at, at actually uh, Cannes Film Festival last year. And now, which was a delivery to a mobile device, and now we're actually going to be delivering that to an application that comes out soon to consumers. That'll be something available to them for the first time that you actually have a volumetric capture that will be delivered um, to a consumer-based device. Awesome, that's great. I'm gonna to go to uh, Seth. We just talked about TrueView. I know you talked about the NFL and the NBA, but certainly I know you have some experience with TrueView. Love to get your perspective on it and share some insights with uh, NBA on TNT. For sure, I mean, you know, we've worked with uh, Rick's team at Intel for quite a few years now with in the VR space as well as with TrueView. Um, we've done it in NCAA for March Madness. We've done it in NBA and TNT, and we've also done some content on Bleacher Report with them. So uh, we're big believers in it. I mean, our first and foremost is, you know, how do we enhance the viewing fan experience? And obviously what Rick provides is that to a T, you know, whether it be VR where you can, you can produce the feed yourself by clicking through different angles on the court that we, that we have set up or following a director's cut, which is actually showing you kind of a more produced feed. And we also have a separate um, talent to call the game. So you get a different perspective from them. So it's a little bit different of an environment unless sitting court side or sitting center um, court, if you will. Uh, and then with VR, I mean, with TrueView, it's been amazing. I mean, if you think about it, like an all-star weekend for NBA with, with AT&T slam dunk, to be able to take some of those amazing dunks and literally spin it on a dime and show every angle of what that dunk looked like so people can truly appreciate what, you know, these athletes can do. Uh, so we've done that for quite a few years. Um, you know, last time March Madness, we had it in 2019. Too bad we didn't have it this year. We didn't have March Madness. Uh, and then TrueView and NBA. So we, in, the, in the arenas that it's installed. So we we do quite a bit with it. And I think it's been a fun product to, to be a part of. Can you also share a little bit about the VR experience? I think you get, you get to be courtside, right? You're like right there at the court and you get the VR experience. Seems yeah. like a remarkable opportunity to do more of that. 
So typically, and, I, and I don't, hopefully there's no one to fact check me right now, but typically we'll have, a, we'll, have a, we'll have a camera at center court. So you have kind of that court side view, you know, eye level. We usually have one on each stanchion of the two, of the two baskets, and then we'll have one kind of a higher locked camera. And what's unique about it is you can, you can, you can pick it yourself and kind of go and produce the feed yourself, or you can follow a produced feed that actually the director cuts for you. Uh, and, you know, in some cases, you know, you, you can adjust the kind of the view, obviously, yourself, but if there's a 2D version of it as well that we've done in a few cases with some of our social partners. Awesome. That's really exciting. Love it. Jason, um, 5G, you're the center of excellence. You see, you see in every imaginable application. Maybe you could just share a little bit about how you see 5G changing the entertainment world yeah it's uh i'm actually geeking out a little bit after i hear joanna talking and you know, obviously seth and rick i mean i see so many diagrams as the network coming from the network company and then as we've you know merged in when, when you know sisters and co sister and brother companies coming together uh spent a lot of time on the warner lot and working with those folks and starting to learn a new perspective of how to look at things basically um, and then you start thinking about all the things that they're already doing. And then how do I take that to a broader audience, whether it's in a connected car, you know, so you can have that VR experience while going 60, 70 miles down the road. Again, there's this massive kind of convergence that has to happen to make that sort of work um, to get to as low a latency as possible, as fast as possible, as much capacity as possible. And um, it's not slowing down, right? So there's just a number of ways we've got to attack it. Because uh, we're showing some things already. I mean, you know, Seth already mentioned that. Rick's, I've seen the things that Rick have done with the volumetric stuff. Um, I've been poking around as, as we always go into these webinar type of things and you're doing a speed dating to get to know one another. Go check out everybody's stuff. And I'm like, oh, wow, I, I forgot we did something like that too, right? And it, it's crazy how far we've come, but how much farther we have to go. Um, and a lot of that's going to depend on this ecosystem really coming together at all parts. And I think that's probably... While it's not talked about very much, um, at least in the consumer view, the emergence and convergence of all these pieces together, I think is really going to start bringing a lot of new opportunities, whether it's 5G, cloud, VR, content, new content, new revenue streams. I mean, we haven't even talked about the gambling angle yet, right, which all that stuff's coming in real time. So it's, it's just, as I started out, I said, you know, I'm sitting in the background geeking out with the people in front of me because... For the longest time, we've been in the back kind of putting things together to make this stuff run from a network perspective. Now, for us to make it work, we've got to see it. And it's kind of like, ooh, that's cool. Well, I didn't think we'd do that. Or it was very difficult to get there and look what we actually did. So um, still a lot of work to do, but uh, a lot of progress in just a very short amount of time in this space for sure. That's absolutely. Can you also just share a little bit about maybe for this group or the larger group here? you know, how you see a difference between 5G and 4G? What, what's the expectations with this new generation that we're going to jump into? Yeah, there's typically three things that I bring up uh, as you know, tenants, takeaway tenants when I talk to, to customers, enterprise, et cetera, about, about 5G. First, it's bigger than just speed, right? Latency is becoming very, very important in, in the construct. Uh, one of the best commercials I think we put out I uh, liked it a couple months ago. It was about the guy proposing to his girlfriend at the dinner table. She takes a really long pause before she says anything. And when she does respond, just this sigh of relief. And any of us that have ever asked or been asked, that pause is latency. And it don't matter if it's five seconds or an hour, it's still the same stomach grumble while you're waiting on the return. That's latency, right? The second piece is, is it's, uh, it's convergence, right? It's all these pieces coming together, right? And how do they work together to create new revenue streams, new opportunities, new business models? And then third, much different than the operators of the past, it's a user-defined network, right? So if we don't build it in context of the use case, we've not used as much as we should have. We've not optimized as much as we should have. And uh, I think that's where we got to get to. And then you'll start seeing some of the predicted speeds, latencies, and all the hype cycle stuff that's not that far out, right, from... Uh, autonomous to whatever else that's out there it's not far right it's just getting those three things kind of tied off on that's great well, i look forward to it very exciting uh joanna let's go back to you i have two questions first let's start with the, with the one i was thinking about marketing the hp reverb to how are you thinking from the larger ecosystem of marketing it 
Uh, this is probably elaborate for the Think LA group that's kind of listening in. I mean, like somebody had asked that in the chat too. Who is you mean? Who is the target market, and how are we actually marketing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the the target market is is fairly broad. It's it's target, and you know, and this is it's both who we targeted as well as who we actually see purchasing it so far in the pre orders. Uh, so it, it's across enterprise as well as consumer. On the consumer side, it's generally gamers and people looking to do entertainment. Uh, social VR or see or, or watch, you know, uh, cinematic VR cinematic experiences. On the enterprise side, it is people looking to do VR to learn, to collaborate, to create, and to connect. So that that you know, we see people across enterprise training, uh, product development, architecture, engineering, construction, healthcare, and and higher ed. Those are the main the main groups that we see. In terms of how we market it, I mean, that's a whole that's a whole other story. Um, you could have asked me, how are you going to market this product, say in February. And then uh, you could ask me, how did we actually market it today? It was very different. Um, we, we made the, the first, the original announcement, we did a tease with Valve, um, aligned with, I don't know how many of you guys actually are gamers in the audience or play, play VR, you know, or interact with VR, but they were, the biggest VR game of the year so far has been Half-Life Alex, uh, put out by, by Valve. And so we did a little tease with, with them in the very end of March. Um, we had a huge big plan of, you know, going to all these events, doing live stuff with press, doing stuff with influencers, doing VIP, go, you know, being, uh, this going out and traveling and meeting all the enterprise customers. And of course, obviously none of that then was able to happen. Uh, so we, we shifted our entire marketing plan to all virtual and online. Um, we, we announced the specs in the end of May and started the pre-orders, which was the first time that HP had done pre-order for our types of products. Um, and we ended up doing everything, you know, digital from online conferences, online virtual online press briefings, to we actually had a, an, an, a launch event in Altspace, which is a, 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 a social VR platform owned by Microsoft at one of our partners. And so you could come in as an avatar and be inside the launch. We had a, a, a 3D version of the headset you could wear. Um, we had a step and repeat. So, you know, Andy, going back to our days at NBC Universal where everything has a step and repeat, everything's glamorous. People feel, you know, like they're really part of it, even though, you know, you were home with, in your VR headset. We did a lot with influencers, with Reddit, uh, with Instagram. So, um, you know, basic, but, but every, you know, and all the Anytime we wanted to get somebody into it, we had to ship it to them as opposed to meeting live. So just a lot of big changes happened to and, and then we'll be announcing the date very, 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 very soon. And then we'll be shipping very soon. So it's been a long, a, a long road. Of course, you know, all, all of our businesses are affected and all of our businesses and all of our, our personal lives have been affected in one way or another by the current situation. Um, and so a lot of a lot of shifting and changing and being nimble and flexible this year for sure. It's awesome. And also just talking about content, you talked about gaming and gaming seems to really be leaning into VR in a really big way. So Far Cry is launching their VR, you know, later on this, uh, this quarter and you get to jump into the world of Far Cry, Far Cry 3, which is pretty awesome. So can you share yeah. some examples? Because I think I know you're pretty much in with a lot of those. Sure. Yeah. So, so, so the uh, Far Cry VR specifically was an announcement between one of our partners, Zero Latency. They're out of Australia. They have about 50 locations, of location-based entertainment locations around the world. Uh, and that was a partnership that they announced together with Ubisoft, who is the IP owner of Far Cry VR. So you'll be able to go in and experience the world of Far Cry VR starting in 2021. Yeah, pretty awesome. Anyone. Yeah, that, that we definitely see really, you know, the, the level of sort of immersion, interactivity, uh, you know, the, the, the connecting with others, the multi-user platforms, though, you know, we, that, we, that's the reason we see VR being so compelling for entertainment and for gaming. But some of those same factors and abilities make it also really compelling and drive strong ROI for things like enterprise training, where, you know, you, you read a book, you end up, you know, you or your employees, you know, read or read a book and end up retaining 5% of the information. You listen to a panel like this, everyone, you know, we're all giving these pearls of wisdom, right? And, but everyone's going to only retain 10% of everything we talk about. So everyone has to decide which one of these many pearls do you want to grab. Uh, and, but if you actually have the experience of doing something, of doing, you know, whether you're 
you're doing it or you're doing a simulation like in VR, you know, how you're getting trained on changing, you know, an oil and gas, you know, oil and gas environment or in a manufacturing floor or even just trying something on, you know, in a, in a, like a sofa, a new sofa for your, for your uh, living room. When you have that experience, you end up retaining 75%. So it's really strong ROI for businesses as well. That's awesome. That's great. Um, Rick, let's talk a little bit about, you talked about the studio, but talk about different opportunities that you see Intel jumping into. Connected cars, one, but how do you see, you know, entertainment changing through different types of devices or different types of platforms that Intel will drive? Yeah, so, so just recently, you might have heard, we, we launched our Evo-based uh, products, so uh, part of Joanna's world. Um, we have every, every quarter, every, every so often, we're always releasing new products and, and new silicon and the latest and greatest. Um, uh, so it takes you to a different level of experience, whether that be something that enables a 4K type of uh, experience on a laptop that you have, uh, maybe you have low, lower bandwidth, given everything that's going on right now with this crisis. Uh, you have low bandwidth in the house because your daughter is on watching a class and your wife is streaming Netflix and you're trying to have a video conference like we're doing right now. Um, we are looking at how we can deliver um, uh, lower bandwidth but higher resolution type of video. So partnering with companies and streamers where you think that, or gaming companies, um, as if, if we were to partner with HBO Max and deliver a bundle type of opportunity where we go to market and we showcase some of these types of um, these use cases uh, to a consumer. So when they purchase a laptop, they might get two months, uh, two months of a subscription to an HBO Max, you know, using you guys as an example. Um, that's gonna, these types of partnerships are coming to the forefront. These types of things are coming uh, to the market so they can show a differentiator when a consumer is standing, if they actually are in a retailer, or if they're looking online to see what the, what's the difference between certain types of devices and where are that ingredient that enables that next level, and that next level type of experience. Um, you know, the other things, if, if you think about, and, and this has happened, I think, in the past two weeks, if you've seen what Hulu is doing, what Sling just announced yesterday as a paid service with Disney Plus, the uh, shared viewing experiences and which I think is really interesting. So looking at how Intel uh, behind the scenes, you know, is delivering those types of um, the delivery of content through transcoding and encoding and being able to do, have multiple functionality within a given type of service. So um, those are really unique things that we work on and you don't always hear about, you know, from a consumer perspective, but from a B2B side, um, I think we, you know, several years ago, we worked with you guys on a major blockbuster release, which nobody anticipated, which was the Meg. And we were the creative, we were part of that creative process. And we were how, how uh, the creators, you know, with Scanline and with Double Negative, these types of incredible companies that are, uh, that are creating the characters and creatures. And the simulation of those characters, the Megalodon Shark, was actually built on an Intel-based machine using some secret sauce uh, Ziva software. So um, these types of things ultimately impact the consumer experience, but you don't necessarily always know that it's, uh, it's, it's necessarily something that goes, it's a consumer-based um, marketing type of opportunity. That's, and that's great. I'd love for you to share a little bit more details. You worked obviously with Warner Brothers, but you also work with Disney and Paramount and some of the other studios. Can you share a little bit of insight with this from from your side, yeah, you know, and and I, I'm really another, uh, and I and I know we're because you guys uh, had this event today, and not just because of that, but a, a project that I'm super proud of is a project that we actually also did with Warner Brothers around the idea of imagining what an experience could be like in the future with an autonomous vehicle, and so we announced that um, actually in, we announced it initially in 2018, we delivered it, and, and we did this big tour in 2019. Um, even at Comic-Con where, because some of the content that we featured was DC Comics. So basically the idea was when you, when you, in the future, and you, and you hone your uh, shared vehicle, it arrives and everything from the, the mobile app to how you unlock the doors, how it knows it's you, the data inside the cars, the personalization, 
all the things that you could possibly think about and what Jason was alluding to in uh, his, con his concept around connected vehicles. And this was actually not done, uh, it was immersive in the sense that there was AR features where you have infotainment or location-based services where if you can imagine driving down the street and you don't want to think that you're in LA or in, 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 or you want to think that you're in you know, Italy or you, you're in Gotham City, you can change that point of view, but having turn by turn directions where you turn on the street and you're turning, you know, turning right down something, you know, that you would in, in, a, in Gotham City. So those types of things, I think, are, are things that we're thinking about in the future. And now things that we're working on more near term, you think about the things that are so far off, but then you start to, to bring it back a little bit closer to home and, and more recent types of experiences like Holoride, which, is, which has been done and the things that they're showing that are much more immersive and VR related um, and, and using the data of the car in order to showcase a, a given experience so you're not getting nauseous along the way. That's awesome. I want you to send me to Italy. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, hey, uh, Seth, I, you know, one thing that I'm excited about is um, what's going on with betting and obviously gambling and, and obviously that opening it up. And I know it's at its very early stage, but I love for you to share any insight into how you're looking at the potential betting and gambling and content and tying that into sports. Well, it's a lot to unpack, but who do you like tonight in the Lakers Nuggets game on TNT? We got game four, so we got to give a plug for that, everybody. But uh, yes. no, I, I think, you know, we are definitely at the forefront of this space. You know, we want to be a leader in the space. We are, we're excited about anything that gets the fan more engaged. And obviously, I think, you know, gambling, betting, daily fantasy sports, you know, free-to-play games are all things that kind of get you more engaged with the game itself. And anything we can do to kind of enhance that is what we want to do. So if you look what we're doing with FanDuel and the NBA right now, um, <clears throat> so we do an, a virtual odds board in the pregame where, where Charles Barkley tends to give his guarantee, which I would bet the opposite if you're a smart person. Uh, you know, we talk about the game. We talk. We, we try to tie it into the storylines of the night. So we try to make it be a part of the telecast. And then also what we're doing right now um, with FanDuel as well is we have this product called TNT Bets, which is a secondary stream that is – completely dedicated to commentary around odds and gambling. So we have a different set of talent calling it. You go in through an authenticated feed, um, uh, just like you would if you're watching TNT on a, on a TVE app. Uh, and that's completely dedicated to that topic. And we're, we're doing more and more. And, and it's an interesting space because obviously, you know, we work close with the leagues. We work close with our legal team and outside counsel. And then obviously the sports books themselves. Like you kind of have to tap dance a little bit because obviously as it continues to evolve and the more states that it becomes legalized and, you know, the more we can lean in on a national level. But we also had the match with Tiger and Phil and, and Peyton and Tom Brady last May that we also leaned in um, with DraftKings quite a bit on, on kind of the gambling for every every hole. We had different odds and prop bets. Um, so it, it's definitely something we see, uh, something that enhances the fan experience for sure. Awesome. That's great. Uh, Jason, uh, going back to you, I think when everyone thinks of 5G, the first thing they always go to is phones, right? Certainly Apple launching their 5G phones later this year. But you got to think of it much bigger and larger than that. Obviously, you know, Dallas Stadium and stadiums that are being 5G enabled and so forth. Can you share something beyond just what people think about it from like the phone side of it to the larger ecosystem of where do you think 5G is really going to enable big opportunities, mainly for maybe advertisers, marketers, whatever uh, out there in the ecosystem? Yeah, it, it, it's there's a lot of foundational stuff. I mean, Rick kind of touched on it too. Like this big, big vision on the other side it takes a lot of data to do that, right? And that, and that data, you gotta get it from somewhere. So you may see, you're gonna see a myriad of sensors start to pop up for a myriad of reasons. I mean, there, there's some will be cellular, some will be uh, Wi-Fi, some will be other means, right? And all that data collection points allows us to create that spatial point cloud, right? Once I have a spatial point cloud, then I can start driving in a lot of extra experiences on top of it. So it's kind of, you're creating a foundation of IoT, right? So I've got a foundation of IoT that helps me build a foundation of data. That data can then feed into the user experience based on who, what, when, where, why. So you take a AT&T stadium, you take you know, Rams, you take stadiums across the country, right, that are lit up with 5G and all that data is being extracted. Now, can I immerse the, the fan into that? 
right? I opted into an experience. I'm in the stadium. Now my, the device you were talking about becomes my gateway into that world, right? I, I'm now immersed and it's my own, my own handset, right? And that way it's, it's more, it's got a, a layer of, it knows me. That's my data point, the things I care about. It amalgamates the data of the, of the event, puts it in my context, just like riding through Gotham city a few minutes ago. Right now I'm inside the stadium and I have 50 yard line seats, but I really want to see the end zone, right? For just one play. And, you know, back to that, that uh, latency example again, right? If I'm a couple milliseconds off the fans roar and I'm still seeing it a couple milliseconds behind, that doesn't work. The experience isn't quite right, but it's all those data points and everything. So that's the first foundation. And the other one that's really cool is, and we're seeing this from the, the car all the way up to, um, is video becoming more than just a, a thing you watch. It's becoming a tool, it's becoming part of that sensor network, right? Video as a sensor for everything from COVID response for checking temperatures up to, hey, I just want to know how hot it is on a pipe, right? Or, or line busting or all these things. But again, that's also another way to uh, collect data that can then be reused to create that uh, personal experience for each person coming in. And then all those things that the rest of the team is doing great from a software perspective, or you think about gambling, that, that's a, a hot one in the stadiums. I want to not just bet on the game, but I want to bet on the next play, right? I want to bet on the next play. And you got a 25 second shot clock. How fast do I have to pull that trigger, right? So it's those kind of things that start happening. And that's not a content thing. That's not how fast is it. That's a latency reaction thing. Because there's not a lot of data. Yes, no is a binary thing. That pack payload didn't change, but the decision time has a real effect on the event experience. Again, your stomach got hurt every, every second that went by when you were waiting for yes or no. Same experience here when you're waiting to make that big bet, right? So all of those things are gonna play into that as we move forward. And yeah, smartphone's gonna be a part of it. A lot more sensors are gonna be a part of it. And uh, you know, what one of my customers says is, I don't care, I don't know what I'm gonna do with the data yet, just give it to me, I'll figure out later, right? Just give me as much as I can, creating that foundation. That's great. I gotta tell you, I gotta, I love a call out to Jonathan Mills who threw out in the chat. This is a Lakers town. Love that. So got to throw that out there. And it certainly is. And by the way, Seth, next time, can we make sure it's a Clippers Lakers playoffs? I was really looking forward to that. I'm a little disappointed, but I'm going with the Denver Lakers uh, round here. I can't say I disagree with you, but we're happy that. <laughs> <I> guess... <laughs> Absolutely. So quickly, can you just tell a little bit about the virtual holograms that I know you guys are working on and some of the things yeah. you're doing with that? Uh, I'll, I'll give you my side of it, and obviously Jason's team makes it happen, but we've been doing a lot of unique things with AT&T 5G over the course of this NBA season. So right now, again, if you tune in tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern on TNT, you'll see the AT&T 5G Hollow Vision interview, where we, we take a talent from our studios in Atlanta and virtually bring them into the bubble. Uh, as a hologram. And so essentially you've, we've had different talent like Draymond Green, Kenny Smith, and Isaiah Thomas go in and interview different people from the Nuggets and the Lakers organization. So tonight you'll see that and it's, we, we kind of make a play off it because it's the safe way to do an interview these days. So they, they beam in via 5G. You know, if you're sitting in the room in Orlando, it looks like you're sitting across from Isaiah Thomas or Draymond. And then, uh, then we come back and, and the person's in the studio in real time. So it's a unique thing. It's, I think to me, it's nice because it's a tangible thing that you can show what the power of 5G can do. And All-Star during All-Star Saturday night and the AT&T slam dunk, we had Shaquille O'Neal holding an untethered you know, 5G smartphone and he was able to have a Shaq courtside camera. So we were able to get a camera view that we normally can't get with zero latency, you know, to, to Jason's point. Uh, and he had a lot of fun with it. We had to get a special grip because his hand's so big, but uh, he was able to produce some of his own content. And then opening night when we were there for LA, um, for LA versus LA, um, we did some volumetric capture um, with Candace Parker and fans could come to our at t 5G uh, experiential space and use their, their smartphone that's 5G enabled to actually see what Candace's prediction was for the season and for that night's game. So the Battle of LA, I think she picked wrong that night, but I, I have to go back and look. But again, and then we brought that volumetric capture on real time into the telecast on TNT, and she gave her predictions to Charles Barkley, Shaquille O'Neal, Kenny Smith, and Ernie Johnson. So it's, it's a fun way to do it. I still think the, the Shaq courtside cam was my favorite, um, but the hollow vision tonight's pretty neat. So, you know, that's what it's, it's to it. to come together. I look forward to it. 
Uh, Joanna, you've, before the pandemic, obviously, you traveled the world, you saw virtual reality everywhere. Can you give us a little bit of maybe just like where VR lives globally and some of the unique, cool things that you've seen? Ah, you reminded me of the good old days, hi, Andy. Yes, <laughs> those are the good old days. <laughs> where I would leave the, uh, where I would go farther than the room next door. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I was really lucky over the past few years to have the opportunity to travel so many different countries from you know, all across the US to Korea, Dubai, you know, all throughout, all throughout Europe, Australia, China, Japan, just tons of amazing places and see and get, got the chance to see what was happening on with virtual reality and all in all of those places you know what how you know how the content creators are really pushing pushing the innovation pushing the uh push you know pushing the the uh the technology in and and really giving us ideas of you know what, what are they going to do with the creativity and how should we where should we take the technology um, so seeing amazing things both on the enterprise side as well as on the on the entertainment side uh, these days not traveling at all I guess I could say not so much but literally not at all and uh, so all of our interaction these days but but you know it has become virtual whether it's on something like this in zoom or in virtual reality so actually the last few weeks I had the opportunity to both attend Burning Man in VR, um, and they had about I think nine, ninety thousand visits, stuff like something like they just released their numbers yesterday. So that, that's not unique, but that's uh, but that you know visits, which is right around the same number of people that would normally go to to Burning Man. You know, if you if you count it that way, um, so they were able to really touch people and all around the world. Yeah, who you know, and, and had this experience and across. I think they had about eight different platforms that they were ac accessing. So that was that was exciting. And then last week, I also had the opportunity to go to the Venice Film Festival. So the last two years, I had the opportunity to fly to Venice and uh, you know go to go to Venice, go to the Lido, take the little little boat all the way to the VR island. We have our own separate island just specifically for VR. Uh, Rick's been there too, and uh, but the, this year uh, was we, we didn't do that uh they, there was, they did do a, a bit of a hybrid for for venice so there's some people were physically there but not but not not on the, the vr side and so uh we were a but there were 44 pieces that they that were presented there um across all a whole number of different platforms so whatever headset you had or whatever whatever systems you had in place at home you were able to access and sometimes some of it even just on your your pc um and we supported and i executive produced a product there uh, a project there by double double i studios and kira benzing that actually won for best vr experience uh so we were really excited about that it was an interactive piece it was a modern day take on Greek mythology. Uh, it was inside of VR chat. So you came in and we all, you know, as the audience, we were all the, the Greek chorus and went on different quests and different different initiatives with with uh, Zeus and some of the other Greek gods. Um, and then we had the, we had a uh, we had an award ceremony in VR. So our avatars were there all together with the the people who run the run the Venice Film Festival as avatars, and we got to win prizes or win win take home the Golden Lion virtually. So uh, that's, that's, that's how it is these days. You can be in your pajamas and winning a winning award at a big, big, big film festival. No more, you don't need uh, shoes or makeup or any of the, the things that you might need for, or, or plane tickets anymore. So. There's some positives, right? There's some yeah. positives. <laughs> Rick, I'm gonna let you put your futurist hat on. What do you, where do you think this is all going? Where do you, uh, give us some insight of where you see entertainment and technology? Where's the crossroads? Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question. I don't think I was prepared for that one. So that was I had I had to throw you one, Rick, because I know you could answer this one. <laughs> um, you, you know, the, some of the things that we see is is you know what what I see is 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 a lot obviously happening with the streamers uh, across the board and and how this content in, how frustrating it is as a consumer right now when you're sitting home on a Saturday night you've got all these different choices. And there's and it's hard to find something that you like, so I think the personalization factor of of where content needs to go, and where you're going to start getting honing in using machine learning, other AI type of tools, deep learning, and understanding who these consumers are. I know AT and T is working on this. I know you know so many different companies are working to deliver these 
these types and, and HBO Max is trying to figure this out. We want to be that, you know, that, that we, we see that as, as, a, as a definite uh, focus um, to, to satisfy consumers of what they want, when they want, where they want it. Um, and, 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 and being able to do that with, with people that they want to do it with. I think that's, that's really important because um, it, it's not always about what you're watching, but you know, who you're watching it with. And I think that's really important. Um, I see on the, on, well, we talked about this to some degree on the automotive side and how that will evolve with autonomous vehicles. That gives, ultimately, the, the biggest thing that, that will, will give back to you is time. And the fact that you're no longer, you know, Joanna, I don't think she really has a car. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry to pick on you, Joanna, because I love this, that she doesn't have a car. And I always, and when I always would reach out to Joanna, she was always like responding right away. I'm like, how is she like not driving to meet her other people, partners, customers, traveling on a plane because she's in the backseat of a car and always, you know, she's, take, she's taking shared vehicles. So I think in the future, the time that you receive back uh, by taking an autonomous car and the types of experiences that you have, whether they be augmented reality, more immersive and how that's delivered, um, especially using a 5G network, using the data around the car um, and, and how that's delivered. I think that, that, will, be, that will be a definite key. Um, next generation experience that we see, you know, we work with the Olympics. So next generation experiences that you see more immersive sports uh, types of experience that, that we see. I, I know Seth, you talked about betting and how that will evolve um, where you can bet on every single pitch of a, of, of a baseball game and you know if it's going to be a curveball or if it's going to be a home run and right before that, you know, the next pitch that comes to the plate. So um, at least from a consumer perspective, some of the interesting things. Education, I think, also will heavily evolve in this, in this regard too with immersive experience. You answered that pretty well. I was trying to get you at the last minute there, but you did a very good job, Rick. Very impressive. I'm going to throw, right, so we have a question. Exactly. We have a question that came in. Uh, this is for Intel, HP, AT&T. Uh, what strategy or tactic has been most effective for you in pivoting to meet new consumer demand in the wake of COVID? Where have you seen new wins? Joanna, you want to take this first and then we'll- Sure, yeah. So. Uh... Of course, everyone has shifted, you know, the, the world has shifted, right? And so, you know, HP jumped in really early and, and tried to use some of our, all of our different technologies to see how we could 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 uh, help the worldwide situation. So immediately used 3D printers to make, uh, to make parts accessible for health care workers around the world uh, and using our partner network. So there were very quickly, there were ventilator parts and respirators and masks that you could access using the, the 3D partner network. We also offered up our, our Z Central remote boost for free for about for for anyone for three months. So you know if you all sent all your workers home and nobody was going into the office where their the powerful workstations were, you could remote boost into into your your more powerful workstations that you would have at home. Um, and then we also offered some software that helps students uh, if if they if they or if, or educators if their if their their computers at home were older and didn't have uh, you know didn't have the ability to do all sorts of, like remote software like what we're on now it would it would do that uh, that software refresh so we did all of that right away um, and then what I would say is you know we've seen just an acceleration. And, you know, I think a lot of the trends, you know, as we talk about this as the future of computing and that we're, we're expecting that this next wave of computing will be some, most likely some sort of smart glasses that we wear on our face instead of staring, you know, down here all the time. Uh, you know, we've seen, we'll, we have seen some acceleration of it, the acceleration of interest in remote, you know, using tech, this technology for remote collaboration, for training, for education, um, and, and, you know, everything that's around learn, create, collaborate, and connect. And, and even, even on, you know, on the, certainly on the entertainment and gaming side as well, you know, most of our, our partners are seeing all time concurrent highs in, in all of those platforms. Um, and then awesome. we're, you know, we're also seeing, we have, we have, we're looking at, you know, what's next. We're, we're, we have more things coming for enterprise and for developers um, around um, some stuff that we're going to announce next week. So stay tuned. Okay, cool. We'll stay tuned. Jason, what, the, do you see any kind of acceleration with 5G or anything around it because of COVID? I've seen video take off again, if that's even possible, right, in terms of the amount of it on the network with exactly what we're doing here. I, I can't remember how many video calls I was actually on, which probably on one hand. 
uh, unless I was in our, our big immersive rooms uh, prior to COVID. Um, you know, I think as, at least at AT&T, I think other operators were the same way. There was an adjustment we had to make with our customers from, you know, centralized people in the office to people working from home um, in terms of how they adjusted, we adjusted. And uh, again, you're putting more broadband, you know, connectivity into a home to do things like we're doing here while, you know, parents with children or parents themselves want to get on a game some too and not interrupting the, uh, the five gigahertz Wi-Fi network running through your house, right? So, you know, you, you, you're seeing, you saw a shift backwards and forwards. Now you're seeing, I'm actually seeing a little bit of a acceleration in terms of some of the automation, right? Um, how can I, especially in you know, automation manufacturing, those kind of places where, um, you know, if I can keep social distancing, keep people farther apart, I, to do that, I need more automation to make that happen, right? What does the automation look like? What does the foundation look like? So you're seeing some acceleration in those areas, which is also coming out in the production side, right? In terms of what we're seeing with uh, what's being requested uh, from, you know, again, from our, our peers, Warner. And again, maybe, I, I, and I, I don't know if it's COVID or if it's just the fact that we're starting to learn each other more and more. And we're like, okay, I'm going to push you, you push me, which is you know, healthy, right? But, it, you know, I, seemingly all that stuff is happening now. Uh, real time and where you thought initially it was, now you're seeing the innovation go back in, use video more. How do we get people back to work? How do we do things to keep uh, areas cleaner using robots and those sort of things? And as those accelerate everything else, right, that comes with it. So, um, adjusted. Now you're seeing people look at automation, uh, video in a different way on top of what we've already been doing. So uh, it's exciting to see and uh, it's, it's accelerating some things as well. So looking forward to more. Great. Rick, are you seeing uh, big changes with the uh, with COVID and any kind of acceleration? Absolutely. The last six months have been just, you know, a whirlwind for us. We, it's funny, as everybody has gone from the office space and if you didn't already work from home, and you went and you now you're now you're at home and all the assumption that that has taken place and to a great degree i think we've delivered on that and with our cloud partners and other partners like hpe when you have virtual desktops like like joanna was talking about from a creative standpoint the creative process of how you access a, a virtual workstation if you're at home um all these things have just you know just to a great degree have worked yes i know there's been um, issues with with some connectivity as as and I know that you guys are looking to solve that with Jason and uh, Warner Media and AT and T team, but um, we've just seen so much adoption. We've seen so much acceleration in workflow um, using types of AI tools or, or solving things that we might not have seen normally in the industry for the past six months. So that's been um, you know from, especially on the cloud side, we've just seen so much more uh, you know where, where the if it, it was funny i was talking to uh, someone at, at, at uh, a futurist actually within another organization and he said you see all these lights he's sitting inside of a data center you see all these lights that are on this data center now they weren't on like three months ago and so the delivery of, of how content is, has happened um i think you know that when we talk about live music and the future of what that will be i mean there's there's projects and things that have actually come to myself and people have come out of the woodwork to see and the innovation that's taking place where you know a lot of we've seen a lot of the live music performers uh, that are happening on the couch and delivering through Facebook and Instagram but there's people that are imagining how a, a, a futuristic a concert would appear in a very stylized way but the the issue is from a fan perspective and, and you know obviously you're in from the NBA and TNT you're standing, you're standing on court, on the court, you see all these, and, and you've seen many, many television shows, you have these individuals that are on screen and are watching, but a two-way experience is being imagined where the artist says, Deo, and then everybody comes back, and right now it's a garbled mess. But we're looking to figure out a way, and again, for a use case around 5G, how do you solve it where it really is that, that fan response, that call-in response, or, when the artist said this singing along with that 
with that song that it actually sounds good that it doesn't sound like a total mess or you're not i think some of it you, you might even understand that that some of the audio is just filler it's not really fans so how do you really get that authentic fan response interaction that's happening close to real time as a result of of what we're seeing in innovation right now absolutely that kind of goes to you seth right we don't have fans in the nba there's no yeah. NCAA canceled but what do you see this COVID making permanent changes and maybe some current changes? Yeah, I definitely think there's going to be some interesting permanent changes that come out of it. I think we've been able to do a lot more with a lot less from a personnel standpoint and a remote personnel. I mean, we, we, we did a, essentially the first major sports event with the match back in May with Tiger, Phil, and Tom and Peyton. Uh, and we did that with about 50 people, which in normal golf tournament, you would have hundreds of staff working that event. Uh, and, you know, we had it set up where we had live view machines in some of our homes so we could actually see what the producer and the director see, like in our basement here. Uh, I could see every camera angle we had and had a direct line to the producer, which is probably better than if, it, if I actually was in the production truck because you don't really want to bother people, you know. And uh, so I, I think I've seen some technology innovation that have been pretty unique and you know cuts back on our travel a little bit and then I think from a fan experience you know what we're doing um, with Michelob Ultra and their courtside experience uh, during all the NBA games in the bubble you know essentially there's virtual suites and you know we have a virtual suite with 32 seats in it you can basically sit like this you can talk to people in your suite you can be seen on television I have a great shot of my daughter right over LeBron's uh face on the court. Uh, and, you know, it's a unique thing that I, I was kind of at first hesitant to it. You know, I, I thought it was going to be kind of a gimmicky thing. And, you know, we've actually experienced it a few times and it's a unique thing. I mean, it's not like being at the Staples Center, you know, watching AD hit that last minute shot the other night, but it is uh, unique. And I think you're seeing people really lean into how do we bring these fans some, something unique. So I think that's going to continue to grow regardless of, you know, where the world goes. That makes sense. I love that AD last shot. But we're actually <laughs> out of you know, we're out of time. I want to personally thank Joanna, Rick, Seth, Jason. I really appreciate you joining our panel, and I hope that was a very constructive conversation for those that are out there with Think LA. So thank you. I appreciate it. Pass it back to you, Don. Uh, that was a great discussion, and uh, I, really thanks to all of you for sharing your expertise and your insights and. Uh, and a big thanks to everybody who joined us this morning here today. And uh, we rely on your feedback to make our events as relevant as possible to you. And we'll be posting a recording of this event on our website, as well as a podcast of the audio. Uh, again, thanks to all of our great panelists and big thanks to Warner Media for their incredible support and for making this event possible. Please take care and stay safe. And we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, everybody.